Okay, this was um, rather curious then. Um, <laughs> maybe we can make it a bit less formal in that sense. Yes. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm going to start. Um, what I was thinking about with this talk is that when I uh, first suggested this talk um, to um, the symposium, it was going to be very much about an articulation of one very specific project, which is based on um, Rathlin Island, which is um, an island off the island, um, but still in the North Island. Um, but when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the, the what I had understood to be the values of the conference, I felt like it was actually more important um, to hold a space for this idea of kind of questioning methodology um, and thinking about um, not just kind of one specific practice that, that I've done, but kind of more to have a space for exchange of ideas and practice. Um, so I, I was just really interested for, for other people as well. We were sort of simply this talk to think about their own experiences of collaboration and to also share collaboration. Um, one of the things that I'm really trying to do at the moment is link together how this idea of social collaboration and um, raising kind of ecological awareness, um, awareness of sort of planetary crisis can be very uh, entwined. Um, and what I'm kind of trying to do at the moment in my practice is develop this idea of quite a transferable methodology. So I'm going to actually profile very different projects, um, not just focusing on one, trying to kind of think about some, some of the similarities between them. Um, I suppose what unites them is this idea of, of raising awareness of um, our actions and kind of the, the impact that our actions have, and actually this idea of kind of um, the, the value of that space for exchange with others, um, be it kind of with self landscape, human species, <laughs> other. Um, so, what I would like to do actually before, before I kind of go into any, any of my own work is um, I just wanted to start with this idea of three reflections, um, doing the first and the two first. So, just really starting this with thinking about your own, um, your own practice, your own experience, your own um, life world in, in sociology, uh, this idea of what, what does authentic collaboration mean? Um, and and collaboration in, in any sense would be that kind of um, a specific project or actually just um, collaborating, say, for example, of, of how you exist in place or how you, what, what your um, mark or imprint on a place is. So I, I'm, not, I'm specifically not giving a definition on of collaboration because I feel like I'm really interested just to hear that from, from others. Um, so that, that was the first sort of um, reflection. Um, and the second one um, was actually from Joanna Macy, which I, when, when I read this, um, so um, well just like that, well just self, um, this, this question I thought was really, really important. So she mentions um, this idea of, of kind of starting from a position where Oh, oh. Sorry, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry, we we're trying to listen. Sorry, we're just trying to make it work. So, reflect on the experience where you have felt um, a challenging crisis impinge upon your own life. Um, and I'm aware that, say, for example, even saying that, you know, obviously, we're in a very um, like, brief. Yeah, like maybe there's there's not the capacity within the space to go kind of very very deep into that, but almost kind of just to have that um, awareness. So I was just saying, um, we're doing this as a small and intimate event, um, and we've just we just started off with these kind of reflections. With um, so if I if I give maybe kind of um, a few moments. Um, and whether you want to write, whether you want to think, whether actually you just want to ignore these as, as questions and go into your own mind. There's not a kind of prerequisite that you have to answer. Um, but I just felt like rather than coming from a position of me just presenting, um, hopefully this would present the kind of um, opportunity to kind of relate it to your own practice and your own experience, first of all. Um, so let's let's just take about kind of two minutes um, just just to have those questions. Um.
是。Hopefully that's enough time. Um, I mean, I'm aware that obviously that's a very short time and these are very big questions. Um, but I wonder now if um, you, I really like the idea that there was a space over here. Um, so if you'd like to come to a beat. Um, and um, if, you, if you've made some notes that you feel like you need, take those notes with you. Um, otherwise, um, have them in your mind, um, and just find kind of one one other person <laughs> in our school group. Yeah, um, and so when we're doing this, I'm really aware that um, maybe you know each other well, maybe you've never met each other, but um, this idea that you're just taking the moment just to literally just the, the first question of authentic collaboration just share like a really brief sentence but you don't have to introduce each other but if you can try and um just look each other in in the eye when you're talking um and just this sense of kind of um making sure that you you feel comfortable and how you stood so just thinking about this position of standing and this position of kind of openness. So um, especially perhaps if, if you've never met the person that you're, you're speaking to before, um, if there's any kind of nervousness or if there's any kind of tension, this idea of just holding, holding space for each other um, and sharing this very short snippet um, of what does authentic collaboration mean. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So if you have a group, two, two people in a group, so listening, oh, sharing, mm -hmm. forcing mm -hmm. one's agenda, mm -hmm. and allowing space, group work to develop, and Test. that might mean accepting failure, um, and receiving the progression, yeah, not forcing it, and, and so how, 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 how we take the time and spend time with our direction. So, that's how it is. The strength of that. Um, I think I'm add, adding on to that. Um, yeah. One thing that French I was trying to answer the question is that it's not having um, a So um, not applying into a space that I don't care about this product or this stuff, but a wireless yes. thing, which for me is a really free so, um, Especially in artistic practice, yes. when, when a work is all choreographic, you want know, to know what's going to emerge. Yes. Um, it's more than what we are. It's about vulnerability. Um, mm -hmm. and maybe about um, mm -hmm. the way of opening and accepting that yeah. possibly the way that I do things yeah. as an adult. Yeah. Imagine, you know, yeah. that there's not a, like a hierarchy. So especially that might be a flag. Often, like, so like oh, the choreo has yeah. a vision, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's a, it's yeah. about sort of deconstructing me. You know, you might not have ever they ever have um, mm -hmm. an equality and equity to you know, manage, kind of give and imagine and co-create those images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's interesting when you say that, I was thinking as well, it's like shared ownership, but then ownership seems like the wrong word. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's, 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 it's out there. Mm. So that is a word that sounds, mm. um, I know when I've been involved in collaboration, it's just yeah. yeah. expected, yeah. you know, if you're working with someone else, it's really you make it. And it got to change, so you can make a good move. It's, it's, I suppose it's just a trusting that yeah. something will yeah. happen. Yeah. 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 You know, even if it doesn't work, yeah. 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 something will happen. Do you know? Yes, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's yeah. such a nice part of it. Thank you. How do you even make it together? Even just things like the time frames. Or how do you make it together? Yeah. So if I can interrupt you, I'm sorry for a moment. Um, so with, with the second question, rather than um, having a conversation with, with verbal language, um, just I would just like you to, to still face the person that you're talking to, but you can have your eyes open or your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to think of planetary crisis and that, that idea of kind of how, how you've experienced that. So maybe you have a very specific image, maybe you have an experience. Um, just taking take a moment just to close your eyes. Um, I find it um, quite nice just to place your hands on belly or one heart on belly, one hand, um, hand on chest. And just think, 
just take kind of two really deep breaths and then just think of one movement um, that you could do that might in some way reflect or embody or um, allow that whatever that memory, whatever that sensation was about poverty crisis to, to emerge. Um, you don't have to necessarily, you're doing it together, but um, not, you don't necessarily have to kind of really <coughs> stare at the other person. Like it's, it's together alone. Just as you were starting to do that, just becoming aware of the person that you all stood with and thinking about your own movement and noticing as well their movement. So that's just, yeah, I'll kind of lean back in. So find a comfortable seat. Um, but I just felt like it was quite important um, when, when we were start, starting to think about this um, practice and this work about um, coming from a place of your, your own experience. Um, so I want to kind of, um, as I said, I'm not going to kind of go into detail about one specific project, um, but I want to kind of frame um, yeah, kind of two, two, three projects um, with the same questions. So these questions are from um, WIG and Attention Responsiveness. Um, and I feel like, for me personally, within my own practice, these questions, I find them re a really useful framework for actually thinking about um, how to yeah how, how to have an approach to to very potentially different environments, different landscapes, and different people. Um, so this idea of how how can we perceive our bodies with a vibrant potential for being social, for living in sensitive community with human and all beings and qualities beyond the human. Um, and then this this idea that the future work will continue continuously sharing in the joys and pleasures of relating. Um, and then perhaps kind of more actively in practice, so kind of singing and dancing together as practices for generating and maintaining good health and social happiness and for circulating power. Um, and how can attention to relational ecosomatic liveness and non-violent offers um, offer different qualities of our storytelling on futures in the world for human survival? So those are kind of really um, questions that I feel um, within, within all of the work I'm doing at the moment are kind of a really um, important point of reference and point of continuity. Um, so in, in terms of kind of an overview of, of what I'd kind of like to share um, today, um, I would say a lot of this work really started on Western Island around kind of 2016. It was very much a process of um, like self and landscape, and um, this idea of kind of being very much like with the landscape. Um, I don't want to say alone, because but not with any other human, um, and just kind of working really very much like with the land, um, and then kind of developing that now um, more broadly into kind of collective workshops and collective practice. Um, but coming from that place of kind of the importance of um, that collaboration initially between human and non-human, um, actually on, on the island itself. Um, what I'm really interested in at the moment is how a shared, lang uh, how a shared language, be that kind of verbal or non-verbal, and movement and this idea of kind of meditative movement, 
um, enhance and um, enrich our connection to place and the sense of actually if we're all having a shared experience does that help with this idea of kind of social responsibility um, and, and kind of meaningful social responsibility in, in our interconnectedness um, I'm not going to kind of read out all of the questions but the, this idea for me at the moment is uh, really interesting in terms of um, how these ideas within choreographic practice can then kind of um, lead into more like political ideas of what you know what does democratic co-ownership of land mean which especially on somewhere like Rathman Island that's quite interesting of like kind of what if we're engaging in lots of practices of uh, like um, I don't know, like some of the work that we've been doing at the moment of just like kind of walking the, the edge of the island in um, in groups or like one person's blindfolded or um, or staying really close together, like all of these things, like how can that actually really help with this sense of really a shared vision of a future of a place as well? Um, yes, so um, at the moment I'm kind of working on three, three different projects. Um, so there's um, this idea of kind of shared embodied narrative of Rathman Island, which is called The Field. Um, I'm doing a, um, a dance company project with um, third year undergraduates um, at Kingston School of Art, um, where I'm currently a senior lecturer, um, and exploring how, through the process of making a dance company, how we actually explore this idea of collective, um, collective process. So, um, and that, that was kind of, for me, when we were talking about this idea of collaboration, this idea of really um, enabling through the process of higher education, this sense of complete, um, like, collaborative co-ownership, co co-authorship, co um, yeah, and making. And, and the other project, um, which we've just kind of started at the moment, is within Gary's Women's Centre, um, which is called We Move, Sharing Place We Walk. Um, which is about working um, with local women in the city of Derry, London, um, to explore their relationship to place and themselves. Um, and yes, I'm not going to go into too much detail in each one, but what, for me, what kind of unites all of these projects is how can collaboration within movement practice really help us think about how we interact with the world and with the world. Um, and kind of thinking about this idea of outcome. So sometimes it, there might be, say, for example, with um, with the dance company, like there are performances. Perhaps more significantly, though, is it's this idea of creating a longer-term like social network, or this idea of um, facilitating a notion of a code of collaboration, which you can take there to kind of lots of different projects and lots of different places. Um, I'm really aware of time. I know we started late, so I don't want to sort of. Oh, yeah. Beatrice, you can run 10 minutes over. Okay. So um, this is going to end at um, 10 past. 10 past, okay. Yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, so you, you do have a bit of time. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so one, one thing um, that I wanted to kind of um, start with um, in terms of kind of what, what is a core principle that I suppose, I suppose I'm working with at the moment is this idea of kind of cultivating universal respect. Um, so, say for example, if, if I'm working with undergraduate dance students or Rathlin residents or women from the London Centre, a lot of a lot of this work I feel has has started because of a position of almost like disengagement. So disengagement from either the self or disengagement with um, place or landscape, kind of post-COVID, um, and and this process of asking, like, how can we come together to heal? Um, so um, I think it's Donna Haraway, this idea of kind of staying with the troubles, so facilitating a greater awareness, um, a greater awareness of um, collective action to both ourselves and the spaces that hold us and, and we hold. Um, and I think that, that for me, as, as a kind of basic and, and universal principle, is really important. So it's, it's creating safe spaces and spaces that actually say, for example, encourage and really um, define that importance of respect for yourself, respect for others, respect for the, the, the places that you're in, um, as, as that kind of core universal principle. Um, so at the moment, kind of working in higher education, I'm really interested in this idea of um, 
for what, what does an embodied edu educational process what can that facilitate in terms of developing meaningful relationships with others, but also in a wider context of, of how we um, exist in the world. Um, so at the moment, I'm, I'm running a programme which is called the SEJ, which is called the Self Empowerment Journey. Um, it's a new um, sort of student initiative that we have at Princeton University about um, psychoeducational, um, like. <coughs> So that's supposed to be the end, but <laughs> um, so um, how how we can actually um, think about ourselves in relation to others, but also this idea of what what does global citizenship mean, and what does um, what does it mean to say, for example, be an artist in the world at the moment in terms of your responsibility, in terms of um, the kind of practices that you promote your agency um, as a developing artist, like what, what you can do um, with it, within your practice to facilitate others to have to have an awareness. Um, so that's that's something for me that's been really important in terms of kind of thinking about my own teaching practice as, as being this kind of way of trying to then embed, say for example, some of my own feelings about sort of environmental activism or um, yeah, kind of making this space for them for them to meet, basically. Um, and I, I think one thing that I've, I've become really aware of at the moment, um, certainly with, with this new sort of dance company initiative, is this idea of, um, I think it's, it's Robinson, this idea that when, when we think about learning environments, it's, it's always about offering and affording opportunities for someone to really fully connect with some, something Personally, so actually, say for example, if, if we talk about, um, I don't know, like say I feel at the moment I've, I've got quite a lot of um, undergraduate students who feel maybe quite um, disconnected from place. So we, we started working outside and asked them to be kind of barefoot in in mud, and you know, in, in 21 years of life, they, they've never done that kind of thing. Um, and it was it was very well me saying, okay, this is you know, it's about you connecting to the earth. But actually, if a student doesn't feel that then um, you know we, we had some really interesting conversations about then what how, how could you feel more connected to place and what does that connection mean and what what can we um, do collectively to um, enrich and engage you in your understanding of, of your relationship to place world environment um, so that's that's kind of been something um, that for me has been really important in terms of this idea of kind of creating more meaningful and inclusive learning environments um, when we're thinking about this idea of global citizenship. Um, I'm I'm really interested in this idea at the moment of um, actually evaluating dialogic teaching. So um, if if we say that dialogical teaching is collective, receptacle, supportive, cumulative, all of those things, but I think for me what's really interesting is actually learning through evaluation of through kind of student evaluation like actually how much students really are taking on these, these ideas of kind of learning cycles and learning practices um, I'm not going to dwell too deeply into that um, but yeah kind of I've, I've been looking a lot at kind of this idea of um, cycles of reflective applied practice um, and trying to link that to cold reflective cycle of learning as well um, but thinking about this idea of um, taking your own experience and then kind of putting that into artistic practice, then taking that into research, taking that into higher education teaching, then taking that into reflection, and kind of this, this continuous process of, of reflection. Um, I'm really aware of time, so I'm just going to kind of skip skip through a lot. Um, but one, one thing that I think um, for me kind of links a lot of these projects is this question of how, how do people attuned to each other um, and what does being social mean to you um, and this idea of um, when when we get, and when I say each other that could be kind of human or non-human how, how do we give um, space for this attention and care within kind of workshop processes and how how can that space kind of facilitate and enrich this idea of kind of group health um, so just a, a very brief, um, I think I'm probably, yeah, I don't have very much time, I'm aware. Um, so when, when I started kind of working with this um, project with my students, um, we, we started looking at a film of Kyle Scotsky, um, which was made 
between uh, 1875 and uh, sorry 1975 and 1982. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's an amazing kind of fundamental film, which feels ever more relevant now, I think, than than you know ever really. Um, but one thing that really kind of drew me to this as as, as a kind of call for action was the state of um, what does Kayana Scotsky mean within the Hopi language, and it's this idea that a state of life that calls for another way of living. Um, and I found that a really great way to, so I, I watched the film with my students, um, and we did it in quite like an informal setting, um, and it, it was kind of, it was, it was a really interesting, and I didn't, I didn't give much introduction to it, we just watched it. Um, and then started kind of, and then I said to them, okay, like what, what is it from this that we can take? Um, so then over three months, they kind of co-created a whole series of workshops um, from the film. Um, so say, for example, like the emergence of mankind from a cell. So, um, so when, the, when they said those things, what we did was kind of co-create a curriculum that would actually say, okay, like, what, what exercises can we do to think about how we emerge from cells? Or, this idea of like um, co-creating, imagining our future, like um, so. Say for example, like we work with different um, local ecological organisations to to see what they were doing about imagining future. So it was kind of like they came up with this list, and then my my kind of role as facilitator was to think about okay, how how can I help a curriculum that actually supports what they want to learn. Um, so, so we did some work about um, the impact of us kind of not connecting through this kind of mechanic aut automated life. Um, uh, a lot of students were saying that actually they, they felt this real inability to, to interact. Um, so we did a lot of work on sort of contact improvisation um, and the, the sense kind of post-COVID about this avoidance or fear of touch. Um, so what, what was really, for me, what was really important is that these were things that actually students really wanted to, to learn and to do. Um, so that, that kind of went through a whole, like we did lots of workshops, um, but kind of as, as a group of, um, you know, a really strong group of kind of 12 students, um, what, what I think came from this and what's been really interesting from this now is that like their strength and unity as a group. Um, yeah. So what did we learn from this? Um, this idea that, um, yeah, maybe I won't read all of this out, but for me, the, possibly the most important thing of this idea that togetherness, like this idea of a shared sensibility of like, how can that process of us coming together as, as a group of people with these questions about how to, how to live together, how to live responsibly. Like that was all kind of a co-created process. Yes, it had a performance outcome. Yes, it had a film outcome. All of those kind of artistic outputs, but it also had a real shift in um, kind of going back to the idea of the, the um, self-empowerment journey. It had a real shift in how students saw their sense of collective responsibility, um, which for me, I, I thought was really significant in terms of um, thinking about impact of higher education teaching. Um, oh, I don't know if I have enough time really to go <laughs> through all of these. Um, but um, yeah, I think I've got about three minutes left. Is that right? Three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so moving kind of very, very swiftly on um, and kind of linking that to the work that I've been doing in Rathlin, which is a very different process because it's very longitudinal. So obviously work with kind of um, undergraduates is done you know, very specifically at, at points in the academic year. The work that I've been doing on Rathlin, it started in 2016. Um, and um, I've just kind of had funding now for the next um, two years to kind of continue um, like creating these collaborative workshop processes um, and, and to kind of look at uh, like a, a, it's, yeah, like a community program. Um, so kind of just some bits of documentation. Um, but for me, what's been really exciting about the work in Rathlin is about this idea of um, how do we um, how do we share our experience of place? Um, I'm just gonna let me just skip through. Um, so I think what what we try to do, um, and everything is kind of co-created. So say for example, like. Um, 
arriving to workshops with this idea of co-creating scores or co-creating experiences or just holding open space where say for example 20 residents will get together and we'll think okay we've got two hours and we really want to learn about um, uh, I don't know a, a specific field or a specific coastline or a specific rock like we have very like very nuanced and very tiny focuses uh, but it's this idea that um, through that idea of co-creating the workshop process to try and empower an agency and ownership. Um, but always working for, say, for example, things like authentic movement and improvisation, um, and returning to this idea of kind of um, to breath, to body, to meditation, um, as, as a way of kind of host, hosting and holding that space. Um, when, when we were kind of starting this workshop, I think just to kind of give a really nice example, um, we were just working in, in one specific field on Rathnall Island. And we were just working very, very, like literally just walking the perimeter of the field, uh, across the field and doing all of these different exercises about sort of how to embed, entwine and interact with that field. So from the whole island, just going really specifically in, into one field. Um, and that was linking to John Burgess. Um, let me just go back. Wait. Um, there's a lovely quote from John Berger. Um, there we go. Yes. Um, so this idea of a field as an event space, um, which I, I feel is, is a really important way of, of linking this idea of um, um, bodying a space. So this idea of once, once you notice something happening in the field, so say for example we did a lot of um, improvisation exercises about like how does grass move or how does um, an ant cross the soil or um, the sensation of like your feet going like deep into the mud of the, the field. Um, but once you start to notice one thing in the field, it becomes like this way of really fine-tuning your perception and fine-tuning your ability to see. And working with, say, for example, some residents in LA who, who'd never stopped to take that kind of deep connection and that, um, that kind of um, very, yeah, kind of deep, deep earth way of connecting to a field, like that was a really interesting way to suddenly shift our, shift our perspective and then all sorts of kind of different things came up from that. Um, I'm going to to probably for us now, um, but one thing um, that, that I hope kind of in terms of going forwards um, and thinking about this, this idea of kind of what, what um, our role as, say, for example, educators or like this idea of kind of social responsibility and practice to draw awareness or um, like this idea of, of, of um, the wider reach of practice, so say, for example, co-creating um, co-leading, co-facilitating workshops as a way of kind of opening up that space of, of facilitation. Um, yeah, that's kind of a, a, a sprint through lots of different ideas. Um, but yeah, to go, um, I think we probably have to finish now. But one thing I hope that you can kind of go away with, um, probably straight into another talk, is this idea of how, how in your own work are you linking collaborative practice and um, ecological awareness. Um, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. And I'm sure that if um, that you're around, aren't you? So people can ask yeah. you questions. Yes. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. We've now got to a turnaround to another presentation that's coming in, streaming into the space from the internet. So we're going to try and make that work. If it doesn't work, we're going to try it for a couple of minutes to see whether it does work. But if it doesn't work, they will still go ahead online. So you can either log into the Zoom space yourself, or later on at your leisure, you can watch it online. But we're just going to see whether we can make it work. So please bear with us. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are uh, 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 uh,
Which I think we're just about to do. So, Lindsay, uh, welcome. Uh, I, I'm sure the other studio will disappear from the screen in a moment. Um, but I would like to um, very welcome you to Sentient Formativity. Sorry, I'm in quite a noisy space, as you can probably hear. Um, but um, I'll hand the stage over to you. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm just going to get set up. And um, I'm just going to share my desktop. And... Um, yes, are we able to see my slides? Okay, I have, I haven't heard a no, so I'm just going to continue, but please jump and let me know if you can't. Um, okay, thank you so much for um, having me here today. I'm so glad to join from afar, and I just want to say a huge thank you to the panelists for all of the organization and magic and accommodation um, that's had to happen um, to accommodate this virtual presentation and the conference at large. Um, and thank you for um, the opportunity to join the other panelists today. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in for the sake of time. So it's, it's quite, it's the middle of the night where I'm joining you from and earlier today I was out in my garden and I deadheaded the irises in the garden. And I was thinking of each one of them as a tiny abortion, the flowers not going to seed. I always have trouble thinning plants in the garden, but I don't have the same turn of the stomach when removing a flower from its stem, the meristem at its end, and this line of growth no longer able to produce except to reproduce. Um, it's not uh, it's not fair to project myself onto plants, and I work hard to try and remember the limits of my own understanding and perception, and to remind myself of the expansiveness of a plant's unknowingness. Um, but still, sometimes I seek dissociation and remember all of the times that in the company of plants, I have felt welcomed into passivity, dissociation, a mind of embodied senses, not dominated by vision, but more a scent, a felt sensation. Um, it is this position of receptivity and sensation that I want to guide my talk around today. And I will share examples from a body of artwork in which I practice and propose receptivity as opportunities for interspecies encounter and coalition. And I ask, can practices of receptivity allow us to more ethically engage in challenging conversations with a diversity of human and more than human participants? And can olfactory and multisensory art lead to embodied learning and a deeper connection with the landscape itself and its many multi-species inhabitants? And before I continue, I also want to um, respectfully share that I am joining you today from Treaty 4 territory. Um, in what is now known as Canada in Saskatchewan. Um, and here I'm situated on the territories of the Nehiawak, the Anishinaabeg, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. And the University of Regina is on Treaty 4 lands with a presence in Treaty 6. In considering communication, so often much of the attention is placed on the speaker. In my work, I am interested in developing the role of the receiver. I want to start with a few technical definitions for communication. Um, I return often to this diagram by Claude Shannon, who wrote a mathematical theory of communication in 1948, so pre World Wide Web. Um, of a general communication system. And we often return to this, um, I return to this, um, but often the focus is usually on the information source or the message 
um, even the noise. Um, but I want to focus our attention on the receiver. I'm interested in the complex and situated reality of the receiver and in practices of receptivity that validate the passive, the open, and the vulnerable. I also look to biological definitions of communication. Um, and here's one um, from the book Plant Animal Communication by H. Martin Schaefer and Graham D. Rexton, who write a definition that focus on the receiver. This invites an active attention for a number of practices of listening, transmission, and reception. These practices position us as radically receptive members of communicative assemblages that include not only humans, but also non-human organisms, materials, and technologies. When we acknowledge that we are already participating as media in communications of other species and objects through material exchange, we can begin to ask more challenging questions about how to participate ethically. And I'm going to talk through a few examples of work as I explore these questions and consider these questions. Non-attachment to the ground was a radio and scent transmission broadcast and recorded live at the University of Illinois, Chicago's greenhouse and plant research laboratory on Sunday, May 1st, 2016 at dawn in partnership with Radius Experimental Radio, UpTool, and SoundCamp Reveal. A geophone and a condenser microphone attached to a helium-filled balloon broadcast sounds live on the radio, accompanied by the amplified sound of the room. These contributed to a 24-hour broadcast of dawn across the world, following the sun and its rising for a day across the radio waves. The geophone amplified vibration so that we could experience low rumblings of the infrastructure as something that happens within our bodies. And the microphone in the balloon also amplified very sensitive sounds. Its extension from a long wire allows us to collapse multiple audio experiences into the same moment. And as human listeners, we are in a position to listen to sounds that were previously unavailable. Within this hour of dawn, at the greenhouse in Chicago, our global radio broadcast was accompanied by a local broadcast of Scent, and here I worked with Scent designer Joey Asel. The release of Scents into the air was a local broadcast. It is unavailable in the recording, and this underscored the sensorial experience of being present and the possibility of sense-based communication. Technologies of communication are not neutral components, but actively establish a channel of communication between plants and receptive visitors. The radio transmission contained audio that was not available from any direct sensorial experience within the room. It amplified the ground and the air, the signal going directly to the broadcast and later recording. So the only way a visitor could hear those elements was through listening to the recording or the radio broadcast. Thus, the recording contains something not available to those present. The airwaves were filled with both signal and scent, and for this visceral broadcast, along with the cables and transmission devices, and radio receivers necessary to hear the sound, our bodies became necessary parts of these technologies of reception. In April 2019, I built on this idea for a project in a small community art and tech space in Pittsburgh called Assemble in the States. Signal to Nose was an installation that supported a kind of double broadcast where two types of warning signals were sent across the airwaves. The installation was set up as a kind of broadcast room where two types of signals could be transmitted. For this show, I worked with green leaf volatiles, or GLVs. The compounds plants waft as warnings to nearby plants and insects in moments of stress. To the human nose, these notes often go unnoticed, or they register as that pleasant whiff of freshly cut grass. What if we were receptive to these notes of warning, these unseen signals all around us in the air? And this is just a um, quick example of some of the diagrams indicating the many ways that plants communicate with one another. 
Alongside this scent transmission, a simultaneous low power FM radio transmission broadcasts another kind of warning signal. The voices of youth climate activists organizing school walkouts internationally to protest climate inaction. The radio transmission could be heard in or near the gallery by turning on a radio tuned into the designated FM frequency. And the green panels on the wall were infused with the sense as isolated chemicals as a form of abstraction. And I'm sorry, I don't have these for you to smell today. The playlist grew and was shared widely with input from local artists, young people in the neighborhood, even a folk music list served with songs of climate change. And um, this microphone was set up during the opening event um, to, to collect recordings from participants who were answering the question, what would you say, um, what would you say, uh, what would you respond to the warnings of plants? So the playlist grew, um, it included input from local artists, young people in the neighborhood, even a folk music was served with songs of climate change, um, and interviews between a student I was working with, with local residents about the air quality, um, which in Pittsburgh is the result of energy industry in the area, which is a source of employment as well as a source of atmospheric toxins. Um, this also spurred a more recent piece, Radio Perfume, which is a score for scent release for solo or ensemble for one to eight human or botanical performers. Um, Radio Perfume takes as its starting point John Cage's radio music and adapts it to another form of airborne broadcast. In radio music, Cage indicates a series of FM frequencies for performers to tune their radios. Here, I indicate the scent chemicals released by plants to which the human nose is receptive as a form of interspecies encounter. This photo was taken during a trip to a soon to close uh, coal power plant outside of Pittsburgh. I stood on a dry graveyard lawn next to a historic church nestled among ruderal plants. Late summer goldenrod and pokeweed wafted volatiles into the air, catching the breeze with sulfuric fumes from, industrial, from an industrial slurry pool. <clears throat> this olfactory composition was situated to this particular time and this place, a soon to close coal plant, the gentle sense of plants which thrive at disturbed edges, necessarily experienced only by visiting this place and at this time. <clears throat> I turn to Sean Shu's excellent work on the importance of olfactory art, which confronts us materially with the realities of environmental risk, particularly in the atmosphere. <clears throat> he writes, I approach atmospheric violence as a mode of proliferating toxic debilitation without forgetting that debility can give rise to transformative, even intoxicating modes of knowledge, experience, and community. <clears throat> the next uh, two pieces look, sp look at specific relationships with other than human species, mosquitoes and later poison ivy. Ongoing anti-colonial indigenous work about kinship relationships and climate justice is critical to these kinds of multi-species configurations. <clears throat> and I turn to the work of many indigenous scholars and knowledge keepers and this includes the philosopher and climate scholar uh, Kyle Powis White, who articulates powerful frameworks for the political implications of multi species relationship. And I'll turn to uh, Kyle White again later. This work with scent and airborne signals allowed me to understand communication as a form of material exchange. To breathe, we must also inhale. So taking an airborne molecule suspended in the air or what Stacey Alimo refers to as transcorporeality. In an interview with Laverne Cox, feminist scholar, 
uh, Bell Hooks talked about the illusion of safe space and asked, what does it mean for us to cultivate together a community that allows for risk, the risk of knowing someone outside your own boundaries? This is a guiding question in my work and in my contributions to or constructions of social spaces. <clears throat> and here again, I look to Kyle Powis White's skepticism around indigenous and so settler reconciliation, particularly related to discussions and activism around climate change. Inherent to whiteness and settler colonialism is a problematic conflation of purity and safety. For those who benefit from these systems, Safety is not only assumed to be possible, but is treated as something to retreat into rather than to struggle for. These writers undermine the assumption of safety as something that can be found in isolation, <clears throat> offering instead forms of social, political, and ecological coalition based in shared risk and collective work. I'd like to turn now to consider risk, whiteness, and consent through a body of work involving toxicodendron radicans or poison ivy and the communicative potential of arushio, which is the chemical contained within these plants that can cause an allergic reaction at the surface of the skin. I work with poison ivy for many reasons, including its maligned position in spaces of nature and for the fact that it thrives in conditions of climate change. Poison ivy, um, thrives in disturbed areas, but the leaves also become larger and more potent with the toxic chemical ruchiol when grown in a carbon-rich atmosphere. This plant challenges and aggravates the surface of my skin. It irritates my understanding of the environment. It refuses to be idealized. It demands an understanding of the image of what we call nature as not pure. Let's consider this just for a moment in the context of whiteness. Societal momentum keeps whiteness invisible, allows me as a white person to disappear into privilege and power. I know that to undermine white supremacy requires a kind of agitation. It requires a continual reckoning, and it also requires being prepared to lose something. I became interested in the plant and the details of this exchange with Arushio. The chemical itself is not a defense mechanism of the plant, but rather a way for it to retain water and protect itself against fungal infection. Our autoimmune reaction to the chemical has nothing to do with the plant's use. I became interested in becoming familiar with the chemical as communication. Eventually this project transformed and I offered this experience to others to share the risks of intimacy with toxicodendron plants. <clears throat> in Arushio tattoos in 2016, I offered temporary tattoos using Arushio, which was applied to the skin for exposure of about 20 minutes and then wiped off with a poison ivy scrub. For most participants who were allergic, this resulted in a controlled rash appearing 24 to 48 hours later and lasting about two weeks. Before the application of the tattoos, participants signed a waiver to discuss the risks and to provide a moment for negotiation and consent. This included some practical things, I am not a doctor, and potential emotional experiences, fear, discomfort, pain, and uncertainty. This is not a legally binding document, but an opportunity to voluntarily discuss and accept risk. Particip participants were also given information packets so they could be prepared for what might occur. And some participants sent me photos of the rashes as they unfolded over time. And this is one of my favorites. These kinds of practices allow us to consider other forms of relationship. What if I contaminated my sense of purity by inviting others into my border? What if I willingly risk some of my own safety for the experience of knowing another? Even and especially knowing that I might feel the discomfort of losing something. In grieving the loss of species and habitats, can I also welcome the loss of unjust power and unjust systems? 
I don't want to compare a controlled rash from poison ivy to the lived experiences of institutional racism or to confuse this work for activism. But I do want to propose that in these small moments of consenting to risk, of resisting a false sense of security, of inviting knowledge outside of our boundaries, we practice what is necessary to take the larger risks necessary for transformation. And equally important to know what kinds of support we need in taking such risks. I'd like to consider risk just for a moment within an abolitionist framework and consider an event that occurred last April. Actually, now it's been two Aprils. Um, during not only the early onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and its airborne transmission, but also during the first week of 2020's widespread uprisings across the country and world against police brutality and racial violence. During this time, you might remember the incident or maybe not, but you might remember the incident of a white woman calling the cops on a black man in Central Park because she was afraid. There's a lot to unpack here, but one element of this incident was a white woman's fear and her immediate soothing of that fear by calling on a system she knew would privilege her word. What if that fear was managed not by infrastructures of oppression, but instead by a measured assessment of the risks involved in this situation? It takes time to process unintended harm was part of a group show, Plants and Animals on Monsters, Cyborgs, and Other Hybrid Creatures, curated by Rebecca Ledita in Chicago. In this piece, I extract the Arushiel by hand and in public over the course of the three-week exhibition. The leaves of locally gathered poison ivy plants are pressed onto a substrate of local lard to draw out a rustule in the manner of the scent extraction method known as enfleurage. You can see here the rustule oxidizing on the edges as it turns from clear to dark brown and black upon contact with the air. The piece was installed as a mural and it's on the inside of the, um, of the glass. And I returned regularly throughout the duration of the show to add fresh leaves to the enfleurage process. The long story of whiteness is constructed so as to tell white Americans, like myself, that we are not the dangerous but the fearful. And in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see Americans and especially white Americans struggling to confront the reality of the danger of simply being present, evidenced in the insistence on reopening the economy at the expense of vulnerable people. Instead of reacting to fear by reaching for an oppressive system to feel safe, what would it mean to approach the risk? What would it mean to accept that there is no safe space to realize as um, and its seeing rights that purity is not an option and instead to find solidarity and form coalitions of mutual support, not to stay safe, but to stay careful and caring. In Undrowned, Alexis Pauline Gums looks to marine mammals for lessons of black feminism. Introducing her chapter on vulnerability, she describes the porousness of the marine mammal skin as always exposed, surrounded on all sides by depth. She asks, what could enable us to live more porously, more mindful of the infinite changeability of our context, more open to each other and to our own needs? In this last piece I'll share, I consider this question with newer work, which I made last summer. <clears throat> Just a quick content warning for needles and blood. I'll discuss, like introduce the piece and then I'll end on a video, um, which we can watch together as we enter Q&A. Let me sip a future beyond my blood involved a series of actions in service of attracting female mosquitoes and offering both nectar and blood while attuning to the tactile sensation of penetration by needles while volunteering at a residency in Wisconsin. I was interested in the fact that mosquitoes generally feed on nectar, but female mosquitoes require a blood meal to lay their eggs. <clears throat> I was thinking about the harms of reproductive futurism um, and interested in my relationship with these insects as a kind of queer kinship 
and offering something beyond my blood. In Wisconsin, I created a mosquito attractant scent by extracted scent chemicals into um, a scented water, also known as a hydrosol or hydro distillation. <clears throat> um, and this was distilled from sweaty socks, Gruyere cheese, and Daucus carota, which is a species of wild carrot in the family of plants that's pollinated by mosquitoes. And so I distilled this into a scented water. Um, this scent was then applied to my skin in a ritual offering to attract female mosquitoes. During the same period of time, I participated in a workshop that was shared and run by another person at the residency on needling or a form of erotic piercing in which the surface of the skin is penetrated with piercing needles for pleasure and sensation. A layer in the queer erotics of this activity was a kind of sensorial resonance with the mosquito bite. I compiled documentation along with this recorded text during the ritual application of the scent, which I'll play for you in just a moment. The piece was presented as part of Beyond Green, curated by uh, Triple M for Hot Wheels Festival 2021. And the piece was presented as a live text and image-based conversation with Christy McGuire, beginning with the video and proceeding to topics of reproductive futurism, femininity, labor, and capitalism. As we watch this final video, I'll end on these questions. As receptive members of complex assemblages, are we more po poised to imagine profound and radical change to allow for the possibility of pleasure in circumstances of dissonance, to consider the possibilities that things might have gone differently in the past and so imagine another kind of future. This is not to dwell on the past, but rather to suggest that it is perhaps in a shared pause that we might recognize the vital possibilities that arise from living in a collective present. And, um, this video should have sound, so if you're not hearing it, please let me know. of a future beyond my blood. Let my blood carry on in the life of the mosquito. Let her swallow the nectar. Let her take pleasure. Let her be seen for her desires, for her complex desires. Let me love her as she needles my skin. Let me feel the needling as pure sensation. 
Let that sensation ground me in my body and in hers. Let me bleed through her. Let me offer her more than my blood. Let me cover myself in dark clothing for her, to wait in the corner of a room for her, to be doused in the perfumes of attraction, a floral, acidic sweat of my exhalation. Let the heat rise in my body. Let me sweat for her. Okay, thank you. And I know we're running late, but perhaps there's time for a question or two. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you. That was a uh, quite an extraordinary presentation. Wonderful. There's so much work, so much in there, uh, and uh, there are things coming through. But um, it's uh, almost hard to know where to go. Um, I th there have been quite a lot of questions around. Well, actually, I just want to say that uh, in terms of the um, you as a as a, an artist and a scientist working in the context of the natural world, what seems extraordinary about this work is its kind of viscerality. Uh, this isn't about you know pretty butterflies and beautiful plants. This is about a, a set of relationships which you are delving in the most extraordinary way and opening yourself up in a bodily way um, to uh, a, a form of communication which we seem to be have become completely afraid of. And I think that whole, uh, lots of interest in, in the thing you were talking about around risk. Um, um, but I wanted to ask a question about you know, we, we're beginning to understand so much more about about the microbiome and about the kind of about mycorrhizal conversations. And I wonder if you feel there's a similar of kind of set of. Excuse me for a second. Hey guys, sorry. Can you just keep it on? There? Um, um, 
I wonder if you feel that there's a similar kind of uh, relationship between the plant world and uh, at, at, that, at that level of, of communication. Yeah, thank you for the question and for, yeah, for your thoughts about the work. I also just want to say that I'm not a scientist. I've not been trained in science, though. Okay, I well, approach you, it as, you, you, um, it reflects very well in the work that you're doing, working at that level. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I do engage with a lot of, um, with a lot of science material and science readings. Um, and, and part of that is, yeah, sort of keeping up, trying to keep up to date with some of the really incredible work that's happening in the field of plant communication, which I think necessarily draws on a lot of fields that have sort of been traditionally outside of science um, and other ways of knowing um, that are outside or that have maybe even challenged um, sort of conventions of science. And um, I mean, there's been incredible work talking about the, um, yeah, the, the multi-species communications that happen um, between fungal networks with plants. I've mostly been focusing like some of my recent um, like science reading around um, green leaf volatiles and volatile organic compounds. And there's not a lot of knowledge about sort of like where the agency is in how these chemicals are released. And so there is some, some thoughts out there, like, is it the insects that are triggering it? Is the plants that are triggering these releases? And there's some thoughts that it might actually be fungus that sort of, uh, you know, has the agency in, in releasing these uh, communications. But to me, it's just interesting that that sense of authorship is not clear. Um, and that's sort of like a practice or thought um, I'm interested in thinking with. Yeah, it, it feels to me like, um, you know, while there were many, many benefits from the Enlightenment, that the Cartesian, that Cartesian split where essentially uh, the, hum the human became you know, the dominant element uh, has shut down a whole um, e e exploration into knowledge that we're really only just beginning to bring back alive. Um, uh, ironically, uh, in a way, just as we, as society as a whole seems to be, the, the relationship with the natural world seems to be becoming increasingly irrational and increasingly risk-based. Um, it's interesting, by the way, that you pick on poison ivy because um, having lived on, on both sides of, of the Atlantic, uh, there, over here there's nothing really quite like poison ivy. Um, there's nothing that will attack you in quite the same way. But we did have some American friends visiting who uh, recently, who one of whom got stung by a nettle. And we were very surprised at what kind of, how, what kind of a reaction that was, that was the, how the, the toxins built and then released over time. Anyway, that's a bit of a sidetrack, but um, I wonder if you think that you, because you referenced COVID and our, how that has also changed on our sense of risk and, and connections to natural world. And I wonder if you think something fundamentally has shifted here that's you know, either for the good or for the bad. Uh, that's a really good question. I feel like, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting because I had been sort of thinking and working with and, and approaching risk from this sort of like individual and theoretical perspective for so long. And then when COVID hit, um, I was sort of noticing for myself, like where and when I was willing to take more risks and when I wasn't. And so um you know, I think it's really different for different people. And I think like in general, there's been a sort of disregard for disability during COVID. And that is really frightening to me um, since of course we will all become disabled in some form as we age or um, in other ways. Um, but I think there's also just been more sort of discussion and negotiation. And it, like, at least in, in my world, it's become a little bit more normalized to sort of discuss and negotiate um, comfort with risk before a lot of social experiences. And so maybe there are some 
uh, yeah, silver lining there about how we negotiate risk together and, and communally. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to end the session, uh, we, even though we're running late, we're still now on time. So thank you so much. Uh, an absolutely extraordinary set of ideas. It's almost so, too much to deal with. It came through in 20 minutes, which is quite extraordinary. But I, uh, I think your, I think the personality of your work is, is quite extraordinary. And I think the, it's kind of political engagement, likewise. I get some feedback. So thank you so much. I look forward to the other talks. Thanks for, so much for having me here. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. No, we're not here again. Okay. And then I share the screen and start again. Thank you very much for inviting us, Louisa and myself. Um, I can't see Louisa right now. Um, <laughs> So we are two of a five people collabor collaboration, a research initiative together with uh, Coventry Center for Dance Research and Coventry Historic Trust. And we will be introducing stage one and stage two of our work. Um, I hope you can hear me. I, I, Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. OK. So it will be uh, Louisa is now online as well. Um, what we are going to do is we are going to share a short film essay with you. And then we'll be introducing ourselves. Um, the film essay is about the first part of our research project. Um, and after Louisa and I introduced ourselves, we will be showing you the second part of our research project, which finished in May. And we will conclude with uh, small introductions by our three colleagues who can't join us today. Uh, and they will then, those introductions will take us into the Q&A and it should not take more than 17 minutes, we hope. So I'll start uh, with this film essay and then I will be starting to talk over it in uh, one and a half seconds. Let's hear before we see. Let's cast an arc. You, sound, have traveled from afar. You enter a human ear, you oscillate, you come up in the door, you knock. Your knock is received by three tiny bones, grown to amplify you. So when the last of these three knocks on your behalf on a door further down, a door that opens to a watery realm with resident hair cells, that first grew 240 million years ago, you, sound, become a wave that ebbs and flows, and you become a sway 
swinging from left to right and back again, just like our hips do when we walk. As you move upwards a spiraling channel, you dance with the hairs. Some of them rise and fall with you, others sway in your rhythm. And when the rising tips of hair meet the sway of your gait, their mouth open and release that which we can hear. So I'm Petra Johnson uh, and I shall be speaking about the object which emerged from a process that began in 2011 when I was building a hybrid maze labyrinth in a museum and had an urge to touch the walk. That's when I did my first weaving. Consequently, I made a weaving at every subsequent artist residency. And in retrospect, I can now say I was reverse engineering, that I was taking off layers, freeing the warp from the frame as well as the weft, until it finally moved off the wall and became free hanging. At that point, I began to work with a movement artist in order to make visible how our very simple act of walking agitates the air. The warp started off as the echo of movement, but quickly became more. The work led me to explore the vestibular system, the push and pull dynamic, and I discovered that there is an ancestry to this organ that goes far back in time to life in water. During a two-year residency with an ethnic minority, the Nashi people in Yunnan, China, I lived in a working agricultural environment, embedded in a community whose cosmology describes a relationship of kin between nature and human. I became aware of rhythms and pulses we share and have been sharing for millions of years with our natural environment. I wonder if we can gain an understanding that the nature of sound, both audible and inaudible, is in fact movement, could we then regain a skill which is in evidence among indigenous communities, an ability to make choices based on far-sightedness, an awareness of great spans of time. Researching the inner ear further, I discovered the hair cells. So at the current stage in our work, the warps present hair cells and are arranged as floating presences in a spiral. And with that, I hand over to Louisa. Um. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Petra. Um, so today I shall be speaking about my experience with the object um, as a mover, a dancer and a witness. So my process began uh, some 10 years later than Petra's 2011 emergence in September 2021, when I was invited to be a movement artist on the Shape of Sound research project. And I had my first interaction with the hair cells in a studio setting, feeling what I can only describe as a gravitational pull uh, to touch, to feel and to move with the threads. And the threads respond to said touch, uh, to breath, to air and to sound. And the shared movement between myself as a mover and the thread is distinct both due to the thread composition where we have experimented moving with silk and wool materials, but due to the evolving locations where the installation is housed, uh, through working with a score, which includes words like spiral, fluid, journey, and softness, Lily, the other movement artist, and I have been moving in collaboration with these threads and with each other. And so within my exploratory and improvised dance practice, um, I have personified the threads 
uh, perhaps because I am aware of what they represent. Uh, the hair cells inside the cochlea of the inner ear are a part of our human system, and it fuels my deep and almost instantaneous connection with the hanging threads, which you can now see on the screen. I no longer feel the need to perform, um, but to allow others to observe and investigate the threads in darkness, in light, in silence, and with sound. And when in this improvisory space, I find that I delve deeper into an awareness of my own embodied technology. Thank you. So, um, Louisa was very much talking about our first stage, which was in the studio, and you saw images of that, which was mostly, we were working a lot in darkness. And this is now stage two, which we completed in May, uh, where we were given the Anglican Mortuary Chapel in Coventry um, to play this. And you see 11 warps, which are arranged in a spiral uh, and I will, we will show you just over three minutes of our work there. And it's silent to begin with. And I will be uh, concluding with um, comments by our three collaborators. And um, I made this choice because Lily is actually um, the one who is reflecting on this work. Um, 
us. So here we go. When I first heard about the Shape of Sound project and the embodied technology that inspired the object, it was both new to me and instantly familiar. My past exploration with experiential anatomy gave me the door into this new, tiny inner landscape. I could sense this space and understand its importance in my connection to the world around me. I was then able to amplify this internal, intangible exploration by engaging with the warps in the studio. The fine, delicate threads that moved at the slightest breath reminded me how delicate the hair cells are and that once damaged, they are gone. This informed my moving exploration, which was tentative, soft, fluid, yet playful. Seeing how the threads would react to the smallest of movements. The exploration deepened when we were invited to bring the installation into the Anglican Chapel. My movement was now also informed by the sound in the space and the presence of the past. How many people listened deeply in this space and how loudly did they sing? During the performance, an audience member reflected that they wondered whose ear we were in. I hadn't previously imagined being inside someone else's ear, but now I will forever wonder what they were listening to when the warp swayed, fluttered and bended to my movement. And next will be Karen. When I first met Petra and her work, I was fascinated by how inherent movement and touch are. The importance of movement is more pronounced when thinking of qualities such as the movement of the threads, how sound is created from movement of hairs, how sound waves travel and move, which we may take for granted until highlighted to us. Working with the threads as an installation and in workshops, you see other people's fascination with the embodied technologies that we all have. The evolution of this technology and how primal sound and silence is, is a good reminder of our intrinsic relationship with nature. As a movement artist, to work with the delicacy of touch deep listening and the intimacy of collaboration is at the heart of what I do. The Shape of Sound project emphasises the importance of these values for human life. It brings us back to our bodies in a society that can take us away. The beauty of this work for me is when we interact with other people and hear other people's stories that they bring to their experience of seeing and doing. These stories contribute to further shaping of the work. And Vip, last. <laughs> it was my fascination with aporetic experiences, the notion of entering a space and exiting the same way, but you are completely changed, that wove in so well with the shape of sound. The possibility that something within you has inherently changed is the essence of being an audience member or a visitor experiencing a creative work or space. It could be a change in an understanding of a concept, a view of life, or a view of yourself. Petra's work that, Petra's work that makes experiential the relationship between touch and sound in the inner ear does exactly that. It allows us to be in a space of silence and stillness where layers of movement and expression are continually taking place. Reflecting on those COVID lockdown times, and even now where most of our interactions are virtual, knowing that when we hear someone speak our names, we are inherently being moved or touched, both reduces our apparent separation, removes socially constructed communication barriers, and comforts me. The installation and performances offer those entering the space to ask themselves about how touch is core to their experience of sound, silence and stillness and what that means for their presence within their world and others' worlds. Now is that, um, we 
complete I should be speaking about the object which oh, sorry, emerged sorry. from a process that began in 2011 and I was building a hybrid maze. Sorry, <laughs> there had to be a hiccup. <laughs> uh, yeah, and with that we, we finish our presentation. I can, um, I will share just a few of um, the books that informed me. It's just a small selection actually. Um, I don't know if you can read it, which were specifically relevant to the work at the Anglican Church. Um, because we are looking also on how our relationship to the dead changed uh, moving from Catholicism to um, um, yeah, moving through the Reformation, what the effects of the Reformation were. And we look forward to your questions. <laughs> Uh, Patrick, can you unshare your screen so that we can yes, yes. see everybody? There we are. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you. It was uh, really interesting to see that work and kind of get a sense of it. But obviously, it's very much in a, a felt space. So uh, to have a third hand uh, experience of it is 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 interesting. But I'm sure we we're missing a lot about yeah, we, what's we, happening. We we would have liked to have brought the walks <laughs> to the Absolutely. studio. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, a question from Lindsay, actually, who was with us earlier, um, to say, uh, um, she says, I'm curious to learn if this project has changed your own listening practices outside of the piece. In other words, whether it, I suppose whether it's had a kind of much more general effect on in my my personal case it was that my listening changed first and then the project developed out of that that was yeah um i mean louisa you might have a different <laughs> hi yes thank you for your question lindsay um so we i um well petra and i actually had a discussion about our own uh, experiences of hearing and listening. And I think it's important to differentiate the two um, because my experience of hearing um, is impacted by my, um, I wear hearing aids. So I, my whole experience of hearing is very different and what I hear and how I listen is a very different experience to Petra's who is uh, German and her experience of language and of listening and of hearing is very different. So I think as a collective, um, we all approach those experiences with sound and of sound differently. Um, and as the projects continued and as it sort of developed, um, I'm aware of when I'm in the space with the threads um, and I can't see Lily, I feel like I have now developed a sense of her and like a, like, a, I don't know quite how to describe it, but I know she's there. Um, and that I often draw parallels to um, lip reading because I, I lip read. Um, so if someone's saying something behind me, chances are I won't hear them because I can't see it. And so that kind of connection with our different senses and how we isolate a sense and how we perhaps compensate for a a difference in sense um, I've been reflecting on a lot and I think he, seeing the hairs as well in a scaled up form um, yeah it, it just raises all these questions <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely uh, if, we, if I can just add something uh, what was an amazing discovery was that these hair cells can be traced so far back you know that that this part of our body developed before there was earth but before there was land not earth <laughs> and this this kind of yeah that we have something that is so old uh with the oh, i didn't know that that's very interesting uh, yeah and do you think other um uh, do you think the non-human world we know the non-human world is very attuned to to uh listening and and to uh, just spatial location and all those things and I, I just wonder if you feel you know you took about this being a kind of so uh, almost a pre-human uh, uh, 
facility that we have, whether we have um, lost that connection more over time, and particularly Louisa, that for someone who has a hearing loss or hearing impairment, if you feel that the, the normal, probably using the incorrect words here, but the normal hearing world um, it takes it for granted a little bit too much. Hi, yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's interesting. I, I find, um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's an interesting question. So I think taking for granted, I think we all have our own experiences and we all have our own instincts in that way and we all know what our own experience is. So I, I don't know what your experience of hearing is, just as I don't know what Petra's experience of hearing is or Karen or Lily or Vips. And I will never really no, know no, that no, because no. I don't embody it. Um, so I don't feel as if I have a loss um, and I think that's something I've been thinking about as well with hearing loss and in the kind of scientific audiology type community we talk of loss. That's why I was using the wrong words and I knew it. But... No, no, not at all. But no, but that's the word that is used. It is a loss. Um, but I don't ever feel like I've lost something um, because I never had it. Um, exactly. So yeah. It, yeah. We're all attuned to our own experiences of where we are in space ultimately and i suppose that is what the shape of sound is with the threads that we're we're scaling that up and we're in that space with these threads and we're moving and yeah moving with it in different ways um and that's the joy of it as well every performance that we do every sharing that we do looks totally different and i suppose when we connect with different people and we talk with different people our experiences and our connections are going to be completely idiosyncratic in that same way. So, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I think for, for what's wonderful about uh, th this work and this kind of work that is attempting to make the invisible visible, or, or in some sense, Petra, making the felt yeah. feel felt in a different way, the, yeah. the instinctive felt in a, in a more... Uh, a connected way. Yeah, I liked about Lindsay was saying about uh, reimagining the past. I think also yes. that yeah, yeah. there is an aspect of that which I wouldn't have been able to articulate until I listened to her in in the work as well. That yeah. Well, well, thank you so much. I think we will draw this session to a close. I'd like to thank you and your collaborators. It looks like it was a fabulous team. Uh, and very broad, very broad. Um, so very interesting. Well, thank you so much for being with us thank today. Thanks. And um, we will move on in this ex rather extraordinary event. It's been wonderful to have you with us. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.